friends with music. Are we putting you on a plane after this? Sorry. Yeah. The airport. Mm. Okay. Mm. But I get to see a couple of people. Let me know if you need me to narrate it. No, it's <laughs> 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 no smoking, no. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the feminist lounge, ladies. <laughs> Good, Hannah. We'll start our live stream. Uh, welcome to the 2018 Feminist Writers Festival. My name's Christy Clark. I'm the co-chair of the festival. I want to acknowledge that our festival is being held on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation and to pay my respects to them as traditional owners and to their elders past, present and emerging and the elders from any other communities who might be with us today. I also want to acknowledge that today is National Sorry Day and to give my personal and our institutional apology for past and ongoing wrongs, including the removal um, of Indigenous children in this country. Thank you so much for coming along this afternoon to our session, Writing Violence and Writing Change. Obviously, this is a topic that's been all over the media lately due to the Me Too movement, but it is a much broader topic and our three fabulous panellists will be exploring it from a range of different angles today. We, of course, need to highlight that this session will involve the discussion of violence against women, um, including in the home and other subjects that could potentially be triggering to people in the audience. So please look after yourselves and please feel free to step out at any point if you need to take a moment and our volunteers will assist you in finding a safe space for that as well. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to ask everyone to turn their phones onto silent because we're both recording and live streaming the event today but we'd love to hear from you. So do join in the conversation on either Facebook or Twitter using the hashtag FWF18. 
I have three fabulous panellists to introduce you to today. Jessamy Gleeson, here, <laughs> has recently completed her PhD with a specific focus on feminist activism online. She now works at RMIT on an ARC-funded grant examining image-based sexual abuse on, online. Uh, Jessamy has previously been on the organising teams at Slutwalk Melbourne, Cherche la Femme and Girls on Film Festival. Welcome, Jessamy. Thanks. <laughs> Tasneem Chokra was named one of the Herald Sun's 50 Women You Need to Know in 2017. So now you've caught up. No. <laughs> that was last year, now it doesn't matter. Now. <laughs> Can we turn the slide off at the back? Yenrong, is that okay? Is, we could get that off, just so it's not in eyes. Thank you. Um, as well as writing and presenting across a range of media, she's now board director for Ambulance Victoria, ACMI, the Luke Batty Foundation, Now Australia, and Chair of the Australian Muslim Women's Centre for Human Rights. That's a lot. Busy. <laughs> Welcome, Tasneem. <laughs> Tara Moss is the author of 11 books and has produced, and produced, wrote and hosted the documentary Cyber Hate for the ABC. She's a doctoral candidate at the University of Sydney and is the recipient of an Edna Ryan Award for her significant contribution to feminist debate. Welcome, Tara. I'll mention this again, again at the end, but I just want to let you know, Tara's on a bit of a tight schedule today in relation to a flight. So we're going to pull our session back a little to allow a bit of time for signing, but it will be quite tight. And at that point, we will be escorting her from the building no matter how tightly <laughs> and, and um, how much she would like to spend time with you. We will not permit that. So on my apologies in advance for anyone who feels cut off. And I know that for this particular topic, that could be hard. I just want to flag that so people can work and through And it. please reach me online. I'm, I don't have a business card, but it could be like Taramos, the internet. I'm easy to find. <laughs> um, if we get cut off today for any reason and you wanted to chat with me about some, something, please reach me online. I'll be very welcome to hear from you. Um, and I'm also going to be uh, taking questions um, about an hour into our session today. So we'll have a, a lovely discussion. I'll ask you to hold your questions for then, and then I'm going to ask you to come up the front for them for the benefit of our live stream and, and the miking situation. And that'll just be down here and we'll have a handheld mic for you. So save them up for then. Um, and in the meantime, I'm going to hand over to you, Jessamy. Thank you so much. Great, thanks. All right, so I have a variety of questions, as I'm sure you do. I wanted to quickly just frame a few terms before we jump into things. I can't help it. I'm an academic, bear with me. So what we identify as violence. Mm. So the three things I had down were physical, emotional, economic. Have I missed anything? <laughs> Is there, I mean, I'm sure there's more, but when I think about violence and when we write about violence, there's obviously physical violence, which is the big one that comes up. There's emotional violence and economic as yep. well. I, I think that's all really relevant and for our purposes, obviously, we need to mm. make the net, you know, small yeah. in a sense. Um, I think in the context of what is historically happening in Ireland at the moment, I would add kind of like medical violence institutional or violence. institutional violence, mm. legal violence. But I think for today, we'll try to yeah. focus on that physical kind of violence. most um, most often thought of version of violence against women, because that in a, a, mm. a topic of itself is, is massive. And I think there's um, there's also scope within adding to that um, psychological yes. violence. Oh, yeah. It does differ away from emotional. It's a bit more... It's a bit more nuanced and to an extent uh, we use the term of cultural violence yes. mm. but I think it, it needs to be unpacked a little bit too. Mm. Yeah okay excellent and when we talk about writing about violence as well I think today we're going we talked earlier about covering fiction, non-fiction, writing in the media, outside of the media and online as well mm -hmm. so we'll try and cover a bit of that. I wanted to kick off and the first thing I wanted to ask was obviously violence is written about not necessarily well everywhere. I'm sure we're, we've seen terrible, um, you know, examples of this. But are awards and recognition for people that discuss violence in the media beneficial? So I mentioned earlier, and I'm sure a few people here are aware of things like the Staunch Prize, which um, came out, was announced a few months ago, and it said it was going to be awarded to the author of a novel in the thriller genre in which no woman is beaten, stalked, sexually exploited, raped or murdered. So I wanted to get your reactions to that. 
I love it. <laughs> I'm a crime writer and I love it, but I'll also say probably none of my novels will ever be eligible, mm. right? And I'm not going to apologize for that because um, I'm going to write about violence against women and that's important to me. But um, I like that it just illuminates this particular issue. Like when was the last time you read a book in this genre that didn't include particularly um, this kind of violence against women and girls. It's, it exists in real life and should be written about, but again, how should it be written about? Is it the only plot line we have? You know, um, so I think questioning that is wonderful, and I like that the prize is out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think, yeah, yeah there's, well, I mean, there's gratuitous violence, and which I think if that applied to, mm -hmm. be, there's a lot of merit in that. And we did toy with the idea of applying this, it's like a Bechdel test, for writers in a way. Mm, mm. Um, but if we applied it to, to male writers in particular, um, would th how would that look? Would that be interesting? Because we know, well, Tara even mentioned, mm. that um, there's particularly a gratuitous uh, effect that happens when, when we see a lot of male writers take up the violence against women trope yes. writing. And if they were held to a, to a standard um, that challenged a lot of the way they write, mm. that could produce something that was quite uh, interesting. And different, and I think that's what that prize is about, is actually pointing out that it would be really different to yeah. see uh, novels in this genre that don't um, rely have on that. don't rely on the, the rape and murder of women. Now, mm. um, there's a lot of that out there. In order to drive characters or character yeah. development or growth. And is that done lazily? Mm. You know, is that done lazily? Is it being done well? Is it helpful in some way, as well as being, yes, a form of entertainment? It's a novel. You know, uh, it's not a speech, but are there ways to do it that are more positive than others? And being someone who's been in this genre for 20 years, mm. yes. So I totally support the Staunch Prize. I think it's a great idea. Mm. It's not going to change everything, but it does really make you question uh, what you see all the time. Mm -hmm. I am interested to see what kind of no nominations they actually yeah. get. And I, you know, I would definitely read those books. But um, Is that a national prize or an international? It I think it's international. So I'd have to, yeah, have a look and see what they actually get nominated or like what's nominated in the end. But the opposite of that as well is there was, I'm not sure if it still exists, but for a while there was an award in which violence is written about sensitively and well. And it mm. was to do with media reporting mainly. So not fiction, but um, you know, reports of media yeah. and violence. And it was to recognise that obviously we can write about violence, but there are certain approaches that may work better than others. Mm -hmm. And again, what, what are your opinions on that? Or what do you think, what approaches do work well? I mean, I'm sure everyone here knows that there are some ways in which you can report on violence that are more sensitive than others. Mm. But for both of you, what do you keep at the forefront of your mind when you're reading these reports? What is good, what is bad? What should go to this award? Well, immediately, the way that the, the, the women's experience of violence is framed, um, whether it's victimhood or whether if it's, whether the framing of a particular report is, is done to favour the humanisation of the perpetrator, mm. like a good bloke. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So yep. there, there is a lot of culpability, I think, in the way that media does frame responses. It, whether or not the comments are actually genuine, um, th there is still a responsibility to the readership mm. and to the sensitivity and the ethics of violence against women, mm. which gets overlooked for sensationalism all the time. Mm -hmm. So I think there needs to be some sort of staunch award uh, for media at, th at that level, that mm. whole, not even an award, it should be an expectation. It should mm. be a requirement that the victimhood of females is not, is not diminished um, for, the, for the sale of a title, mm -hmm. or the sale of a headline. Mm -hmm. Don't want it to be clickbait. It's, it yeah. deserves much better treatment than that. And I think that brings to mind something like the Our Watch Awards for media um, yeah. reporting. And I do think that's it's valid and helpful because it's pointing out good examples like um, at the, one of those awards I was at, I think it was Hitting Home that won, mm. you know, and that was a really tough, yep. real, well-handled documentary, you know? Mm -hmm. So you don't need an award to make a documentary like that, but it's nice to recognise good work when you see it and to show the good examples. Um, and on the flip side, I love Jane Gilmore's Fixed It series because yes, yes. she's pointing out, well, actually, she does also now make a point of uh, looking at the good examples when she goes, wow, someone really got this right, this is fabulous. Yeah. But uh, the Fixed a series is, is really focused on fixing those bad headlines, like 
no, it wasn't an alley that was raped. It was a woman. Um, mm -hmm. You know, no, you don't need to take that quote and make it a, a, a victim-blaming headline about how um, women should stay in groups when, you know, the police officer, I think it was a senior sergeant, very specifically said, my main message here is to the perpetrators that, um, you know, an impaired person cannot give consent. Mm. You know, a person who can't give consent, you know, that's not, um, that's not sex, that's assault. You know, this is the sort of thing that should be in the headlines. So it's disappointing when you see, you know, the yep. media making a choice not to make that the focus of the article. Again, it's like women stay in groups. Again, it's always up to us. Um, mm. It's always put, the onus is always put on the victim. Why wasn't she in a group? Mm -hmm. You know, why was she drinking? Why was she in that short skirt, you know? So while those attitudes might still exist in the community, you know, maybe don't make that the norm by keeping it constantly in the headline. Maybe use the examples that are much more powerful, much more positive. Mm. As a um, media and constitutor, amongst many other things, <laughs> um, my que like, where, is the resp where does the responsibility for that lie? At what stage do we intervene or say to journalists or media students or wherever else, you're reporting this incorrectly. There are guide and there are there are guidelines in place mm. nationally that are to do with things around the reporting of suicide and that kind of stuff. Where do we intervene into that process of journalists reporting it wrong? And things like Jane Gilmore, like Fixed It's great. Yeah. She's not getting paid for that. Okay. The reporter, she's not getting paid for that. Yeah. That's free labor. Join her Patreon because she yes. should. You pay her because she she's should. not getting paid yeah. for it. Yeah. But with that kind of stuff, where does the responsibility lie? Or where do you view that that intervention could take place in which mm. we can better shape that kind of reporting? Editors. Mm. Editors. I, and I say that without hesitation, having done um, training programs on cultural diversity and uh, nuances of culturally balanced reporting. Mm -hmm. um, and journalists will turn up, reporters will turn up, and they'll write pieces. But then once they're filed, they're tweaked. And once they're tweaked, they're presented in a certain mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. And all the integrity in that piece is often lost with a shoddy headline and a bad image. Yes. And it always comes down to editors. Mm -hmm. um, but getting editors to the table to a cultural diverse training session mm -hmm. is really like getting you know, a lot of you know, senior members mm -hmm. of parliament on board with a you know, yeah. <laughs> human rights session. So there's, there's, there are certain challenges which mm -hmm. continue, but we know where the culpability lies. So, I mean, I'm open to strategies of, mm -hmm. of enticing editors, um, you know, whether, it's, whether it becomes some sort of industry standard they have to maintain, some sort of ethics committee they have to report to, mm -hmm. I don't know, the judiciary, mm -hmm. I'm, up to, you know, I'm mm -hmm. open to anything, but yeah. that's, in my experience, that's mm -hmm. where the buck stops. And I think that we do need to give a shout out to the fact that we have a lot of journalists who are trying really hard to report mm. these stories well. Okay. Like I would even say that's probably the majority, but like mm. you said, things get tweaked, headlines get changed, it's happened mm. to me. Mm -hmm. I will often end up contacting mm. a, a publication saying, whoa, 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 you've made this into a controversial headline, there's none of that in the article, can we please mm. talk about this and maybe change that headline? Because it appears as if the writer has written it and that's not the case. Um, but also keeping in mind that, yeah, the editor, the buck stops there, but there's often like quite a number of people that that passes, who mm. no one twigs mm -hmm. before yep. it gets sent out. Like, wow, that really shouldn't be written that way. And also picture editors, there's another Absolutely. fun thing. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, like, Absolutely. deadlines are tight, but we can do better sometimes mm. with, with just the way we're representing the stories. Even when this foundational writing is actually, you know, has a lot of merit, it can get lost before it's read by the public. Mm, yeah, um, and my answer my answer is a bit separate as well because I'm media like I'm from you know academia, but there's such a pushback within academia from what I've seen. Again, some people are trying to do it well and train journalist students well. When I went through in 2008, there was nothing. There were no. Mm. I'm, I'm hoping it's changed now, but there was very little in the way of training students to respond sensitively when discussing violence. In the same way that we had a whole couple of lectures in that on di reporting suicide, mm. there was nothing to do with women. And when I went back years later and asked for us to include something, mm. it was just a no. We're not interested in that. But mm. there are frameworks in place to complain and that kind of stuff yep. as well. But again, I think when you're getting paid as an editor to do it, it's a lot easier. 
yeah. Um, so just to go back to fiction for a minute, um, I, so to go back to crime writing and that kind mm. of stuff, Tara, you mentioned, earlier, mentioned um, that none of your novels would necessarily pass this no. test of um, being nominated for the Staunch Prize. Well, I guess none of the crime novels. None of the crime novels, um, The paranormal, yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. <laughs> um, my main character gets put in lots of really difficult situations that are paranormal in nature, <laughs> um, and, uh, and she you know, rises above and is amazing sometimes literally rising, but uh, that's another story. The, it, within the crime genre, I have tried to, um, I guess, take up the mantle of this particular subgenre within the crime uh, genre itself, and then put my own spin on it and create a very powerful woman who you know, survives. Mm. So in that way, those aspects of the plot are really integral. Like I, I wouldn't take those out, and I wouldn't change that. Mm. Um, but it is different probably than what you're going to see if you pick up a novel that's maybe not written by a woman. There's lots of great male crime writers as well, but maybe not written by a woman, maybe not written by a woman who's experienced violence. And maybe, you know, it, 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 there are subtle differences there, maybe mm. sometimes not so subtle. So I don't want to kind of say, hey, everyone else gets to write this <laughs> genre except us now because Ooh. we're trying to be really ethically my question right. is, who I does get to write that? Yeah. Who gets to sell or explore these stories yes. in fiction? So explorations of violence. Mm. Who, who has that right or claim to be able to write about yeah. that in a way that's effective? I think it's a really tricky topic. I mm. think that um, because violence exists in the world, we should write about it, and we should have it in our art, and we should have it in our media, and we should have these discussions open and there's no perfect crime novel and no perfect feminist uh, and no perfect <laughs> um, media article, but I think being sensitive to what is involved, to the stakes involved and kind of how you're representing things is just a really good project. Mm. Uh, I haven't perfected it myself, but I think it's a really worthwhile project to keep looking at it and keep looking at how you can um, tell that story beautifully and really make it powerful and compelling um, without exploiting people unnecessarily without I mean in this case fictional people but it connects with real life it's not really fiction because it's mm. we're talking about human beings and things that happen mm. um, but yeah I agree it's like a tricky it's a yeah, tricky who has, area. Tasneem what about you because there's such yeah. an appetite for the stories of you know mm. women of colour being exploited in mm. literature and that kind of stuff as well, and it can be really harmful. But at the same time, they're really important stories if told well. Mm. I think there's that fine line between fiction and ethics. Yeah, and so yeah, we do have crime in the world, mm. and people are going to write about it. Mm. Um, people are good writers, but I, the, the ethics come into it when. And you, and you can't impose this and you can't police it or mandate it, but you, you would want in an ideal world for writers to recheck their intentions. So yeah. am I writing this because it's got contextual relevance to the story or is it just like it's great clickbait, people are going to love it, it's, you know, you know it's, it, it, in a way it feeds into violent pornography and so that's what's going to sell my book and so I need to make sure I can, you know, it's all about the money mm -hmm. for want of a better term. So I think if we recheck... And like I said, there's no way to police that, how you recheck intentions, um, then I think that would obliterate a lot of the fluff. Mm. Yeah, I agree. And it's considering, I guess, to where you are positioned in this debate as well. So for me, when I was writing my PhD as a, you know, as a woman of colour, but white presenting and that kind of stuff, the, the different privileges that exist there and existing inside of a university, so being very privileged in order to do the PhD, I had to be a little bit reflexive about what I was writing about and who it was going to benefit. Mm. So where is my work going? Is it going to go, you know, filed away in a library in which other privileged people can get to it and no one actually learns anything from it? Or am I going to be able to put it out there in which people can access it freely and actually mm. apply it? Which mm. in the case of researching feminist campaigns, you want it to be applied because mm. you're actually there to further the cause. Yeah. So thinking about where you sit in that debate, yeah. I guess, is really important too, what you're writing mm. it for, what your intentions are. And I think with nonfiction, that's a, it's a very strong, it's a very mm. strong sort of leaning, and it should mm. be. Yeah. Yeah. And in fiction, there's this wonderful um, history of great feminist crime writer women, like Parteski, yeah. like Bland, like the first, mm. she wrote the first African-American police officer in a detective 
novel, you know, um, or Gr Carrie Greenwood with Franny Fisher, and she deals with a lot of different social issues and injustices within the context of entertaining fiction. Mm. But she's breaking boundaries and she's using that genre very cleverly. And I think that it does have power. I think that it is relevant. And you know, you, again, it's not a speech, it's not a piece of nonfiction, but it's really effective. And sometimes that can be the most effective way to change minds, is to do it through art. Mm. Uh, and I do think that's um, potentially very powerful. And I, I know that for me as a reader, it's often been more powerful even um, mm. to be watching the, the movie or reading the book and getting that feeling of like the change, the progress, the and yes, that feeling of empowerment, the overused mm. wonderful word, um, mm -hmm. perhaps that will be even more powerful sometimes for us than, than reading about um, the nonfiction, very important yeah. Yeah, media absolutely. article. Yeah, it can be much more accessible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's across advocacy and human rights yeah. and not just in, in this space. Mm. I wanted to ask as well, um, because we have seen how writing can, as you say, really affect change and that mm. kind of stuff. Can you think of any media texts, so, you know, books, films, whatever, that have actually done that well? So, you know, as viewers and consumers, what have you seen that you've said, that's great, I love that, that's really shifted my worldview, or that story has, you know, subverted things? So, yeah, what have you seen? I mean, just, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is, is you know, is Handmaid's Tale. Oh. Um, <laughs> Yep. Only because I think, I mean, I look at that and I look at the political relevance. Mm. For me, that's, that's the link. The violence is there, obviously, but I think it, it speaks to the broader, the, broader, the broader topics of control and, uh, you know, where, where women's position is in society in a dystopic future, which is it the mm. future or is it now? Um, so th there are, I think, yeah, so that particular story, I haven't read the book, though. I have to admit, mm. I didn't read the book. I've just seen the series adapted. Mm. And it really struck me as a very powerful telling of where where violence can mm. end when it's institutionalised to the end point. Mm. Yeah, what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. the Margaret Atwood book is incredible is and, and yeah. highly recommended. Um, I would go back to some of my crime writing heroines mm. there, just in terms of like how they've taken a genre that I love. Um, you know, I am a thriller lover mm. um, and made it into a story about these women that are powerful and smart and you know look look back at Nancy Drew at the time that was revolutionary mm. you know mm. it was and it set it, it set the path for many of us decades on because it was for the first time you know you, you were seeing a female protagonist who was figuring everything out and saving the day and um, it's not directly focused on violence against women, but I just want to like talk about Ghostbusters for a second. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to oppose yeah. that. Go for it. <laughs> because I've, I watched the latest, the wonderful reboot, and at the end I was like, gosh, I'm feeling really emotional. What's happening here? What's going on? And I realized that I'm a middle-aged woman, and, it was the f and I watch a lot of film. I'm a huge mm -hmm. consumer of, of, of film and, and novels. I had never before seen on film a gang of women save the world. Mm. Had never yeah, seen it. Yeah, I felt and, that, and like, yeah. I, it blew my mind. Mm. I'd, I'd seen some individual examples that start. We started really seeing in the '90s of mm. individual women, like Ripley, like yeah. Buffy, you know, who mm. were saving the world. We saw that start, but the kind of like the pal gang story mm. of a group of people saving the world has always been male identifying characters mm -hmm. always and we've seen it so many times it's just not even remarkable we've seen it for decades and decades and decades and it just it's like of course yeah it seems really obvious but i realized watching that oh my god i'm like a 44 year old woman watching finally a, fir a first example on film of women saving the world mm -hmm. You know, not in a real life type scenario, but how powerful that is. Like just thinking, gosh, I've not ever seen this before. And you know, it's, it, this is contemporary stuff. Mm. Um, so I think there's lots of ways to do this. And sometimes it can be very far from real life, but it can still have an impact whether we immediately identify it when it's happening or not. Mm. It does change minds, it changes perspectives and it changes the story. 
Mm. Yeah. It speaks to possibility too. It you know? does, and I think yeah. with Handmaid's Tale, that was a red flag of like, watch out, mm. well, this could be us. Mm. Um, I think with Ghostbusters, I see that. And I think yeah. even with Black Panther, it, you know, it, it, there was a reimagination mm. of what the world would look like if it was not written by the hegemony. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. The word. Yeah. And understanding that media has effects and impacts, which yeah. again, yeah. people disagree with all the time, but yes, that representations are important. Yes. Yes. Representations are important. We need more diversity yes. when it comes to film, media, TV, books, that kind of stuff. There. I haven't seen the new Star Wars, but Fandy Newton, I'm aware, wore uh, a red carpet dress made by Vivian oh, Westwood with all of the um, action figure mm -hmm. characters of the black characters who'd existed in the Star Wars franchise. They were all male. She was the first mm -hmm. uh, black, black woman, black woman yep. involved in a Star Wars series who wasn't CGI, so I don't know. Yes. I'm not thinking of exactly what that example Peter would have been. Peter in the latest ones was CGI. Okay, yeah, gotcha. Yeah. So she was like, I'm the first, you know, and, and here are all these, you know, but the difference that makes actually, mm. like just in terms of representation. Yes, it's Star Wars, it's fiction, it's fun, it's entertainment, but representation matters. matters. And representation really matters when we're talking about this violence against women subject. Yes. The women need to be present, their voices need to be present, mm. and that's often removed from the media article or the, the novel writing. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, how do we, you know, when we talk about violence in writing and the expectations that we may have of survivors, we, you know, expect them to come out and talk about these experiences. We expect them to do it not once, but many times over mm. and over again. Tell us what happened to you. Tell us in explicit mm. detail what went wrong. You know, all of these questions that we know are problematic and awful, but how do we approach these expectations, you know, of wanting to hear from survivors, wanting their voices involved in these discussions, not wanting them silenced against the risks of, you know, risk of re-traumatising them? Are there, yeah, how do we, how do, we do that effectively? Mm. Mm. I, my answer first up is, you know, don't do it unless they want to be involved, pay them. Yes, <laughs> yes. oh my yeah. goodness, yeah. pay them. At a basic, at a minimum, absolutely. Mm. And I mean, it's, again, it's, it comes back to, Check your intentions. What's this for? Why are we mm -hmm. doing this? Is it actually going to enhance the cause? Is it, is it going to serve us as, as a society to know, to hear this again? Yeah. Um, is, if we're hearing the same thing again and again. We're not hearing anything different. So how is that actually mm -hmm. changing? Are, are we not learning? Yeah, if we're hearing it we over keep and hearing over the again. Same thing again. Mm. So I think we need to look at that as well. But yeah, look, the, the emotional and traumatic cost, and I look at you know, what Rosie Batty has gone through, having to retell her trauma Mm. I don't know. And now she's thousands of times yeah. to the point where she needs needs to step back. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'm surprised she he's did it, you know, for as long as she has done it. Because mm. uh, in that in that particular realm of sharing such incredibly personal trauma, I think the cost of that to the person is often overlooked um, mm. by even well-meaning people who are wanting to support the cause. Mm. And I think we can support the cause without re-traumatizing the victim. Yep. I think the really important part of that is to let the survivor decide. Mm. Um, because we don't want to take the work or opportunity away from that person and go, oh, well, she won't be able to handle that. Yeah. Right? Because that's yeah. a whole other issue. Like, I'll just assume she can't do this anymore or that this would be too mm. much. Let them decide, but do it mindfully. You mm. know, like, um, think about the context of the interview. Think about your questions, you know. I know for me, being interviewed, I've got Mm. all ends of the spectrum. I got like, do you forgive your rapist? Like on live TV. Wow. Oh my I'm God. like, I don't know, ask all 12 of us. Like, do we really need, is that really what you demand of us? That we go, mm. yeah, he's fine, he's a nice guy, you know. Um, <laughs> but, but to kind of like spring that on live TV. Um, yeah. But then on the other end, people who clearly were following all the protocols, like to interview the person in an environment in which they're familiar, mm -hmm. you know, in their home if they allow that, yeah. or some other place that they have chosen, yeah. um, to have a discussion with them beforehand about boundaries, um, about terminology, mm -hmm. you know, that it actually can mean a lot to some of us to be called a survivor or a victim, and both are relevant, yes. you know, and both are valid, but to, to basically let the person tell this story and have them be the... Agency, um, having agency. Yeah. Having, having agency. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so I wouldn't want us to go, oh, we don't want to have them tell their story anymore, because that, 
I'm going to just make that decision for them. We have to, yeah. again, have the decision be theirs. But, and Tazanim's already kind of touched on this, it's the incredible, it's the ridiculousness of the fact that we need to keep telling the stories. Mm -hmm. That is the biggest thing here, like how, how amazing it is that these traumas have to be retold just for us to acknowledge that they exist. How many times? Like how many studies, how many of the numbers do we have to look at? How many decades does it have to go on before we all kind of just get, this is really bad and it's happening all the time, so that we don't actually require the tears and incredibly intimate details from an individual survivor in order to write our check. And it's not because we have amnesia, it's because we're complacent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we, were, I mean, if we were actually forgetting, that's one thing, but we just like, yeah, well, tell us again, well, tell us again. It's like, mm. pay attention, you know, this mm. has happened, yeah. yeah. And there's a difference too um, in asking, as you mentioned earlier, you know, women of colour, again, mm. or different token experiences, mm. pulling them in over and over again for the sake of diversity or whatever else, and the exhaustion at a whole different level that um, women experience because they're there to be the token yeah. you know, woman of colour, the token queer woman, the token woman um, who is disabled to tell their stories again and have that experience define them mm -hmm. to an extent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that's really important, mm -hmm. I think. Um, I wanted to um, ask, on the other end of this, so people telling their stories to others, but as we're all writers outside of this, how we approach this whilst looking after ourselves. So not just having people tell their stories, but from the other end, hearing these stories over and over again and reporting on them, writing about them, you know, researching them. How do we approach that in a way, not that it's just sensitive because we've explored that, but from a perspective of self-care as well, what can we do to ensure we're looking after ourselves and others that are doing this kind of work? Well, you take that one. Well, I wrote a big section in speaking out um, mm -hmm. my uh, most recent book on self-care because of this issue, and it was very, it's been very instructive and illuminating for me uh, since The Fictional Woman came out in 2014, because it was a, mm -hmm. you know, 300 plus page book, and the media focused very much on the page that where I talked about how I had been sexually assaulted and because that was part of my experience and it was a book about women's experiences and wow, leaving that out would be um, a, big, a big gap and not necessarily helpful. But by doing that, of course, a whole other chain of events began and, and there's a lot of things to look at, decisions to make when you come public with a story, things that shouldn't still be a factor but are you know it's going to get reinterpreted here and there it's going to be the story will be taken out of your hands and told by others and changed and your voice might even be taken out of that which I literally found in articles there was one writer who um, contacted the convicted rapist for a quote and didn't include any of my quotes didn't ask me for comment but also didn't even quote any of the things that were in the book that the thing was, you know, it was just yeah, that's complete removal, um, complete removal of the, of the woman's voice from the story that's, you know, kind of the reason we know about the story is the woman spoke about it. So um, it's that kind of removal of, of your own voice and own agency in your own story, which can be very, uh, very challenging and in some cases really, really a problem. Mm -hmm. um, but I included a big section on self-care because even if, you know, those of us who work in advocacy who haven't personally experienced the things we're, we're, um, we're touching on when we're advocates, what we're hearing is still really often very heavy stuff. It can be really heavy lifting and it's extraordinarily important work and there's not enough support mm -hmm. to, to help us to continue going and usually it pays zero. Mm -hmm. or very little, and it's often those jobs that are the most important for our communities, you know. Um, so it's looking at all of that, really appreciating what people go through and looking at ways that we can practice great self-care to just keep going, because I want to be in it long term. I want you to be in it long term. I don't want you to burn out. And at the moment, the way the power structures are set up, the way the system works, it's kind of like an inevitable train 
that's going to head, you're going to burn out and just end up isolated and, mm -hmm. and not able to do your work anymore. And we don't want that. We really, really need you. Mm. So that self-care question is incredibly important. And there's no right answer mm -hmm. uh, for how to do it. Um, but yeah. if we look out for one, it's going to be different mm. for everyone. If you look out for one another and yourself, you have a much better chance of being able to, to keep mm. going and to recognize when someone else, you know, when their self-care isn't quite working and when they mm. need that added support. And that's why this is a, a collective, isn't it? Because yeah. we can't okay. do it otherwise. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. What about you, Tasneem? Yeah, look, I mean, much of what you've just said, I mean, burnout is real. Mm. It's absolute. And I, I, I always remember this quote that my mother said as, as a new migrant to Australia, she, she used to say to people, you know, it's important that we give and give and give until we have nothing more to give in oh. terms of our ethic. And I'm like, hang on. I don't know <laughs> if I necessarily agree with that now. Mm. Um, I think we need to listen to that little voice in our head. We need to take better care of our mental well-being, our physical well-being, our psychosocial well-being as well, and know that because of the collective, because of the mm. sisterhood or whatever it is, it's we can delegate, we can share. Yes. Mm. It's not our responsibility to shoulder the burden of other people's misogyny all the time or other people's racism. Or mm. um, it's, it's, That's their problem to unpack. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're invested as this is our sole purpose in life to, to demystify. It's extremely taxing um, mentally and uh, physically as well. So I'd say stop, pace yourself and share the load. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Also be aware, as maybe the other person, if you have a, a story to tell, just seeing if the person you're about to tell it to is okay at that moment. If, is this a good time to talk about it? Because if you were um, a professional in this field, like say a psychologist, you have particular hours. Mm -hmm. Of course, you're getting paid for that labor as well, which is another story. And I don't think most of us are necessarily asking for that from readers and fans. but you don't have like hours to clock on and off. And so if I'm going and buying milk and someone yeah. turns to me and starts crying and tells me this story, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to them and I'm going to hear that story, but I'm not going to be prepared. And maybe mm -hmm. it's yeah. going to be it's part of what makes it really difficult to keep mm -hmm. going. So the fact that you know we maybe need to be mindful, and I'll, sh I'll share one of my worst <laughs> examples, which was um, Spending a lot of time with a group of people in an academic environment, and then having one of them what contact me, which was great, and then having one of them, uh, a fellow, contact me and say he wanted to talk to me about this subject uh, over a cup of tea. So I went great. I went to the cafe, and he spent an hour telling me about how he'd raped someone. Oh my god! And uh, <laughs> it was just, it was, it was just like uh, the the. No, you yeah, know, there's so an out of body is this happening? This is just <laughs> like I, you know, I've been hearing this day in and day out online, in person, everywhere I go because of that was that particular moment mm -hmm. for me in 2014 where it was just like, mm. you know, now this is what we all want to talk about. Apparently, nothing mm -hmm. else in the book is all about this, but just not got kind of going, hey, look, this might be really triggering and maybe not appropriate, but I'd like to talk to you about this. No, that no opportunity there, just kind of. You're sitting down with this person, the story starts, and I go, oh my god, where is this story going? And that's where it's going. And just, you have to be, mm. you know, composed and, okay, well, have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then you have to kind of be okay with that. And that there's no um, framework around it. Yes. There's no structure around mm. it because it's not a professional engagement or opportunity or mm. part of your field that you've trained for. Um, yeah. And I guess on that note, I'd also say like total shout out to the institutions that provide training yeah. for people who are advocates or working in this field to deal with things like vicarious trauma, mm. because that's made a huge difference in my Absolutely. life. Even institutions, so my work at RMIT involves interviewing survivors of image-based abuse, which often, so when we say image-based abuse sometimes, I mean often people think revenge porn, it can be broader than that, but it's often tied up in situations of domestic or family violence as well, so these interviews will go on for hours and we'll talk about these experiences of image-based abuse that are often tied up in wider things. And even in that professional environment, in a professional capacity of sitting down and doing these interviews, afterwards there is limited there are limited opportunities to debrief and it's mm. not in a counseling role so we can't help them achieve any outcomes the outcome is based in our research and forwarding that you know pushing forward the agenda in mm. that way but 
Outside of that, I am not in a counselling role to help anyone else. I'm there to listen and record, mm. provide empathy, sure, but can't actually help them with anything beyond mm. that. So institutions, some places are better than others. Some are just catching up now mm. with providing those services for us to be able to continue the research or the work. Academics are usually very good at internal looking and reflection and that, but this is one area that we're still not getting right mm. all the time. Mm. There's an improvement, but I think that there's also an assumption that if you spoke about something, you're just fine to yeah. talk about it and also any aspect of it, mm. as opposed to where maybe the boundaries that you set initially to say, okay, this is, by the way, boundaries are really important, mm. really important to set. But if you decide like, these are the things I'm happy to discuss, I'm discussing it for you know these particular reasons that I think will be helpful and you've made that decision, you can't assume then that that person is happy to talk mm. about anything, any time anything, of day yeah. and will just be fine yeah, because yeah. that's just not human beings, that's not real life and mm. it's an unrealistic expectation. Yeah, I've listened to a lot of Mariah Carey as a result of my work. <laughs> just needed something very light to take the edge off. And so I that's watch my Ghostbusters. Personal strategy. You know, we all have our yeah. ways. We all yeah. have our ways. Like, <laughs> so, yeah, have a someone, bit of fun. And... Someone was asking me the other day, how are you coping with all this? And I was like, Mariah Carey, just a lot <laughs> all the time. <laughs> very light. <laughs> it's just something. <laughs> Um, and on that on that note of you know labour and that kind of stuff, I wanted to get to what um, you know was advertised in here, but and it's one of my favourite topics, which is hashtags and in particular mm. the labour that goes on when we're writing about violence in online environments and we're talking about you know Me Too and that that kind of work. What are the expectations that we have? then of people that are sharing their stories online and where the boundaries are again different and blurred and people are participating how how can you envision that working well versus maybe not working so well because there have been critiques mm. on both you know both for and against me too and it's not perfect can mm. i just say harvey weinstein's in custody mm. yeah mm. like can we just yeah. give a shout out to those mm. over 70 over 70 brave women who spoke out against an incredibly, incredibly powerful individual mm. who had, and in some cases did, ruin careers mm. based on his own agenda and covering himself up. So huge celebration of the little wins. Lots yeah. of problems there, but yeah. he's in custody. There's something happening, and we would not be there without all of those women, yeah. all of those women, right? So me too. Yeah, pretty mm. amazing, pretty powerful, but yeah, pretty imperfect. Mm. Yeah. You know, support mm. for those individual people, and they also, a lot of them beforehand, weren't getting any support either, so mm. it's not new for them. But yeah, when you write something in a tweet, you know, there's no one there to go, all right, are you okay? Are you, yes. are you like literally physically safe? You know, mm. um, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting time because that, none of that movement would have been remotely necessary had the legal system and criminal justice system been operating correctly. Mm. When I say correctly, I mean like, like with law and like, you know, <laughs> criminal Actually, stuff, I'm not sure. good, yeah. let's take you in to custody. Mm -hmm. It just had been failing so mm. many people for so long, that's why we've seen this, but there's an enormous amount of um, you know, complication with mm. the way that this mm. is unfolding, of course. Yeah. yeah. I would take the view, yeah, it's been, it, I think Me Too has put it on the map, mm. but mm. as an issue, I think it has predated, um, oh, yeah. certainly. Mm, yes. Um, yes. <laughs> Hollywood and the, and the director's couch. And I think, for me, it's like then also then giving voice to the other forms of sexual harassment, exploitation, abuse that have occurred. Um, for women in all dimensions, both in mm. workplaces as out workers, as foreign workers, um, as you know, in women in, in sexual in sexual industry as well. So, th I think there's a far broader issue of mm. how do we recognise the ongoing and systemic trauma that women have experienced mm. that's not just related to this particular movement, and what's been done about that, mm. Mm. and how much. While this movement is effective, and yeah, it's it's gone from being, as Tracy Spicer said, you know, Me Too is not just the it's not just the move, moment; it's the movement that, mm. that comes with it, and I think that that's really really powerful. But for me, it's really about understanding and contextualizing the breadth of this movement is far beyond the, the what I call the Hollywood hashtag. Yeah, 
Absolutely, and I think, we, I mean, not just what's happening in Australia's media industry either, but um, from reports that we're hearing even about, you know, just yesterday I read a really gruesome report about detailed abuses of Bangladeshi um, mm. expat workers in Saudi Arabia, for example. Mm. Now, no official there has ever been held account for the, the kind of abuse and the regular torture and rape and um, detaining that they've impacted on their workers and their staff there. And they're fleeing in droves back to Bangladesh and the UN can't even deal with the amount of complaints that they're getting. That's there, that's that case. Mm -hmm. um, we're not even looking and talking about you know, the experiences, I think, of the indigenous women in this country mm -hmm. um, and what they've endured at the hands of the state and what's going on and still goes on with stolen generation mm -hmm. and kids. So I think it's, um, while I'm not, um, disappointed that Me Too has happened. I'm sceptical about the way that people look at this as the moment that defines this issue that has just come up now, because mm. it hasn't. Yeah, there's been a lot of work done on right. hashtag. Like, been, there's a lot of work that's been done on hashtags online and offline to get us to this point of yeah, Me and Too, I, yeah. I think. And I, and I would, yeah. you know, I would even go further to say the experience of women um, who don't have a voice in this, yeah, and in this who aren't even debate are far greater victims of that, of that um, and I think that was the Tarana Burke's intention 10 years yes. before the hashtag went yeah. viral. You know, yeah. she was, she's an African-American woman. Mm. She is talking about people who don't necessarily have that voice or don't have, so many of us have voices, but whether they're being heard, I guess, is the mm. question. Mm. And she was talking about people who didn't, weren't being heard. And um, so I guess I see the hashtag as something much broader than just about Hollywood. Yeah. But yeah, it becomes, what, what is the focus? The focus becomes the people com, who can be heard the most. Yep. And this is the most high, high profile when you start involving um, women whose names we recognize because they're mm -hmm. actresses and they're on the cover of magazines. We're gonna hear those stories more. Um, but it's incredibly important to acknowledge all the women whose stories we aren't hearing. And I think that was one of the powerful aspects of Me Too was just all the regular people who started Mm. saying, yeah, I work in the service industry and this is what happened to yeah. me, or this was yeah. that school teacher and what they did, and yeah. you know, just how, mm. what an epidemic this has been and continues to be. Mm. I think Maxine Venner-McClark, she tweeted something very bril brilliantly on this um, a few months back, and she said of the Me Too movement that the women who were attending the march for the Me Too movement had their... Uh, domestic staff at home, and these domestic staff at home were hoping that those women would come home before their husbands came home mm. earlier. Mm. And, and that put to me, me too in a lot of context. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But she said it a lot better than that. But. <laughs> in 100 yeah. letters or something, whatever. And the voices that, yeah, as you've said, just aren't being heard online. We tend to think particularly here that everyone is online and it's, that's not always the case at all. Not everyone exists online. Not everyone has the capacity to be involved in Me Too or other hashtags that have come before that. Or has access to the devices access, yeah. or exactly. even the freedom in their country to tweet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let alone access, yeah, access to platforms in which change can be created. So it's not it's not universal at all. Nothing's perfect. I want to tear down the notion of you know a perfect feminist, a perfect feminist movement, perfect feminist hashtag, but and have critique that's actually effective as opposed to just critique for the sake of I'm a better feminist than you. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There are wanderings around, which I think mean we're almost at question time. Is that correct? Excellent. <laughs> That's fine. I have the clock at the back. I thought it's got to be time. <laughs> okay, so I just wanted to invite people to come up towards the mic. We have one here for you. If you have any questions for our panellists, so just stand up and, and we'll sort of create, you know, an orderly queue down the middle here. Um, before we do move on... No, you can be as disorderly as you like. <laughs> I'm going to take an opportunity to ask one. One thing I'm really interested in in relation to this question of agency within... Um, know, telling stories around violence against women mm. is the extent to which the legal system serves the strip women of that agency yeah. in the way that uh, sexual violence particularly um, or violence against women broadly is dealt with by the system. They're the mm. only person within the system that doesn't get mm. representation or, mm -hmm. or the capacity to control their mm. own narrative. Mm. And I guess um, I'm interested because you probably deal with this in relation to crime writing yeah. but yeah. it flows on to so much of the other the legitimization of the way that that's been handled broadly mm. because of the power mm. of the system. I wonder if you could speak to that. Mm. 
In my novels, I admit I tend not to um, make them into legal thrillers. They tend to be a little more t uh, leaning towards the vigilante <laughs> area. And I guess I, th I guess I feel that's relevant because the system lets these people down. So I imagine who is this woman who survives this and what does mm -hmm. she do? And in the case of Mac van der Waal through that six novel series, you know, she uh, does herself become violent. It, it, as we see with things like the girl with the dragon tattoo and things like that. So, you know, I'm not saying this is the way to handle it. <laughs> I'm saying that this is some, like, uh, it appeared to be cathartic for some of the readers and for me mm -hmm. as the writer in some respects. Um, and I can't count the number of completely awesome, particularly women and girls, but also boys who've read the books and said, you know, this helped me get through high school. Like I had some really difficult experiences and I read Mac and it made me feel like I could do anything, you know, and like, screw them all, I'm coming, look out, you know. Mm -hmm. So there's a place for that. Um, it's not a blueprint for how to handle criminal cases, um, <laughs> but it has a place in the genre and has a place in storytelling. And, and um, that, uh, so from that perspective, as a legal drama, it would just be really chaotic um, if I was in charge because yeah. it'd be like, this is all taking too long. This is not good enough for justice. We're yeah. busting out, we're busting out of here and doing it our own way. Um, yeah not the way to, don't try this at home, <laughs> but um, that's, that is how I've tended to, to handle it in my novels. Mm. Yeah, look, I think it's a Victorian, I can, a Victorian legal system, coming back to, you know, how is, is the legal system here representing the experiences of, of survivors? I mean, there's been small gains. Mm. Um, I, I can't, we can't overlook those. But I think you talk about structural, um, I won't say misogyny, but patriarchal structures mm -hmm. within a system are always going to have women on the back foot, regardless of how much progress we do make. Um, just looking at numbers of female, you know, barristers, female judges, female, you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah, the judiciary in general and the gender balance within that speaks a lot to where final legislation lies as well. So I think small gains, but a long, long way to go. In New South Wales, this is an interesting historical tidbit I came across the other day in my novel um, research. In New South Wales, it wasn't until 1946 that women were allowed to sit on juries. Mm. So think of the, how that works in the context of being a, survi yeah. a, a survivor or perhaps you haven't survived the violence against you. Mm. you know, who gets to decide what happened yeah. and what should be done about it? You know, women were completely excluded from from that legal process. So, you know, there's a long history that's gonna take a long time yeah, to get yeah. things Structural. across the board um, and forget indigenous women. Yeah. You know, at that point, I think you could, um, uh, you could be admitted as a lawyer by then, interestingly, but we still didn't have female jurors. Mm -hmm. um, but again, only if you were a white woman. Yeah, so I, yeah I've come off the back of reading three or four weeks of case law and I am exhausted. I've been looking at image-based abuse and it, it um, content note, it often um, involves, we've been looking at underage image-based abuse as well. So there's been child abuse material that has been covered in case law. I've come off the back of two readings about that, I am wiped. Um, and sitting at that intersection of, you know, academia and we're going to write research or we're, and in criminology, we're going to re make recommendations for laws. And then as an activist, just wanting to tear the whole thing down. Mm -hmm. It's this weird intersection for me of being like, mm -hmm. well, let's look at the laws and see how we can change them and do all that kind of nice stuff, but it's so slow yeah. moving. Yeah. And then on the other stage being like, let's just have a march. Let's just get up there and scream yeah. down Swanson Street and see what happens that way. So I don't have an answer. I'm quite happy to be in both worlds because um, mm -hmm. one of the outcomes of my research has been you can't have change just on one level. No. You can never just rely on patriarchal systems to make that change for you. But you also, and um, unless you want to burn it all down and start again, which I do, activism <laughs> can help to <laughs> activism, things like slut walk, that kind of stuff. These places all help as well in making that change. Yes. Yeah. I'm writing about uh, oppression of women in Islam. Mm. And um, I have been abused, raped, and all of those things happened, but they were made right by saying, oh, God permitted me to do that. 
and that was not necessarily um, done sort of, uh, you know, there are men who is saying, oh, God has said that it's okay because a woman must do this and that. Um, so through my writing, I'm obviously my language is even though respectful, but quite provocative. And the only example I have is uh, in Fidel and Aya and Hersi Ali and what happened with the submission and the rest of the stuff. So I'm afraid a little bit uh, mm -hmm. about what I'm getting myself into. And uh, um, I just wanted your thoughts and the resources in terms of are there any women in Australia who are writing this particular form of religious violence and violence made right in the name of Islam. And if you had any thoughts about how I could um, you know, get support, I guess. <laughs> yeah, mm. so yeah. that was my question. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Can you answer any questions? I'll let you yeah. mm. Tasneem, do you yeah. have um, yeah. any yeah. particular resources? Sure. Um, so, well, I'm, I'm so sorry about what you've just gone mm. through, mm. first of all. Um, Second of all, in terms of religious violence, um, the organisation that I'm, I'm chairing, the Australian Muslim Women Centre for Human Rights, that recognises religious violence occurs and that men will use and contort religion in order to justify abuse of women as an extension of how family violence is, is understood and consumed within the community. Um, that said, the understanding of my understanding and the understanding that the organisation takes is there is no justification for, for violence or abuse in Islam. So when it is actually done, it is done to service the, the need and the justification for the man as opposed to being a, you know, an edict of the faith, which we do not see that as, as it is. So certainly within different cultures and the interpretations, people will twist it around. It does happen. Um, but there are strong strong movements of, I guess, female scholars and female intellects within the Islamic frameworks who would argue against that and have successfully argued against it to the point where rape in marriage is considered rape now in parts of the Middle East. Yeah, it's actually <laughs> Tunisia. It's, you know, there's some really progressive scholarship that's actually happening on this issue in other countries. Um, it doesn't deter it from still happening within this country as a practice and it has to be called out and it has to be named and it is violence and it is a crime and it is not justified in Islam at all. But people will, will claim that it is. It's a defence, obviously, that they're going to try to whip up. Um, but to the best of my experience, and I'm happy to share some resources with you afterwards, um, this is not, this is not, it's not cricket. Sorry, it's not, it's not, it's not cricket. I'm trying to find <laughs> the right word. It's not acceptable and it's not mm. condoned, no. Mm. I'm really sorry to hear what you have been through. And I wanted to um, acknowledge that, but also say that what you're doing is very brave. Mm. And also, um, on a related note, it's not the same thing, but it strikes me as having so many parallels with the Royal Commission and the comments there about, yeah. you know, God made me be a pedophile. Yeah. Abuse. It's, a, it's yeah. the abuse of power and yeah. every excuse, every excuse. Everything except identifying the perpetrator and it's their actual actions. Yeah. Please look after yourself. I mean, I'm sure you yeah, are as well. But <laughs> yeah. I'm just getting people to come up here for their questions. It's partly related to the uh, speakers and the reverb. That's kind of Thank you. And please just keep with questions just because we are at the end of time. Uh, my name is Roz, and I was just going to make a small comment about the women that are invisible. I work in mental health and have for many years. Mm -hmm. And so my experience every day is working with women where the trauma becomes invisible under borderline personality yep. disorder or complex mm. depression or PTSD. And so, yeah, it's epidemic, as you say. So um, I'm kind of, uh, yeah, acquainted with that every day and, uh, and often mm. sometimes with male psychiatrists that, you know, pathologise and things mm. like that. So, um, so my um, question is that I'm currently about to write a memoir. I'm a survivor of domestic violence from many years ago where I had to flee for my life uh, mm. in New Zealand before there was consciousness raising about it. And um, I've just started, I guess, to put my voice out there and be bolder mm. um, and courage to speak about such things. Um, I've uh, performed in a play last year where I openly talked about um, my experience as a battered wife, as we were known in mm. those days mm. many years ago. But what I find myself doing in myself is and other people may relate to this, I go between um, finding courage to do this, then also being apologetic 
about confronting material, and I'm just wondering if you can comment on that. You know, mm. Still finding myself feeling a bit of poly. You Ooh. know, I'm I'm sorry to um, I'm sorry to disturb you with this offending content. So I'm, that's kind of where I'm at at the moment, mm. as I'm exploring my own boldness to speak in the way that I want to speak. So go between the two. Mm. Tara. Yeah, well, thank, thank you for sharing your story and um, being so brave. And again, I want to say, like, people who come out and speak about this stuff are incredibly brave. It's personal and it's, you know, it's, I'm going to say it is risky and it's, you know, it takes a lot of bravery, but it's also not for everyone. Not everyone is in a position to do so, particularly at a, a specific time. But I, oh gosh, I've lost my train of thought there. I, <laughs> It, it's just such a, it's such a huge thing. Things have changed so much, but there's more to come. Um, and don't, don't let that deeply ingrained thing about women who speak up being troublemakers, mm. don't let that, don't even let don't that let land yeah. on you. Don't, just let it, mm. let it, it yeah, we, we all have this because we, none of us lives in a vacuum and we absorb all of these biases. Mm. I'm myself also. But just don't let that land on you. Don't let it be there, mm. you know, or just go, okay, I'm getting that. That's, that's not relevant and push it away. And, and I try to remind myself of that as well. You know, if I'm talking about something and I see that it's making, frankly, the right people uncomfortable. Yeah, um, exactly. I'll go, I'll go, no, I'm not going to edit myself for their, you know, comfort levels because they just think, you know, a troublemaker talking up, you know, we wouldn't have got anywhere without the people who were mm. having, you know, taking on these really uncomfortable conversations. None of us want to have because we all wish it didn't happen. Yeah, right? you're not, not going to approach it sensitively. You, you know, it's not going to happen. You, yeah. you will approach it in a sensitive manner and that's demonstrated by the fact that you're up here asking yes. us about it as well. You are going to be mindful when you're talking about this stuff and it may cause discomfort, um, but as Tara said, you'll be causing discomfort to the people who probably need it. Yeah. And it's not going to have a shade on the actual experiences that you've already had. So that discomfort in the right place and at the right time is really important and what, what can actually lead to creation of change as well. Yeah, I, and I, I think on the, on the issue of how violence, um, domestic violence specifically, is understood, I think we've, as a nation, evolved very slowly culturally from even the terminology mm. that we use. So that yeah. even you know, 20, 30 years ago, we talked about a domestic, mm. yeah. as if there was a fight mm. with a house. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. Mm. The domestic became domestic violence, and the domestic violence became family violence, violence. but now we're calling it violence against women and children, which yeah. it mainly is, largely is. Mm -hmm. And I think in, in naming it, I mean, it's uncomfortable because we keep on pushing the boundaries, and we need to. Mm. Because as Tara said, yeah. we need to make people uncomfortable with a very uncomfortable topic, because if we don't talk about it, we don't shake it up, it will continue. Mm. Mm. I mean, if we shake it up enough, it's going to agitate someone who is a victim or a survivor enough to think, this is my chance, this is my moment, it's, it becomes a catalyst. It becomes a catalyst when you shake it up enough. I, I really think that on many levels, and just like with racism, mm. the people who are most uncomfortable hearing it are racists. Yeah. And I think with, when you're talking about violence against women and children, the people in the room who are most uncomfortable negotiating it are perpetrators. Mm. So, and we don't want to play into their power by not talking about it. Mm. On, on this topic, I just want to make one more short comment, which is that when... Um, during the big storm that happened, again, it was sort of pre-Me Too, but not depending on, you know, it was pre the viral Me Too. Yeah. But um, when all these headlines were going down, and some of them were just hard mm. and awful headlines to suddenly see about something you really didn't want to talk to anyone about, um, I got a call from a friend of mine whose 10-year-old um, girl had been sexually assaulted and she hadn't known this about me because I didn't talk about it with people, you know, it wasn't kind of my introduction. Um, and she found this out about me and she said, if this has happened to Tara too, it means I can be anyone, I can do anything. She saw someone living their life proud and strong and not being defined by that thing and that 10 year old girl needed to see that. So there's a lot of power in what we're doing. It's not for everyone. It's 
Mm. It's not for everyone, and I absolutely acknowledge that. But there is power in it. And when people say, oh, telling our own stories, uh, and they belittle it, no, you don't get it. You haven't talked to those people. You haven't seen their faces and how much of a difference it can make to individual lives. So it's, it's only one of the ways in which we will change things. But God, it's a powerful one. So thank you. Hi, I'd just like to ask around um, getting support because I do a lot of advocacy work and I know from my own, my own experiences of uh, harassment and sexual harassment and I've heard a lot of stories from my community. Mm. Um, it's, it's very hard to get support and get your message out there. Mm. And, you know, doing stuff through social media helps a lot. Mm. Um, it's just finding that support, getting your message across. How can I do that in a sensitive way? Because obviously I'm talking about stuff that is... Mm. Probably very insensitive, or comes across as insensitive to people. So finding support for you. So finding, finding support for me. Yeah, social media is this great and terrible beast. It's you know, mm. it's great in the sense that you can tell your story and get you know and put it out there, but it leaves you so open to abuse and trolling and harassment at the same time. It can be great for finding support and finding other communities. It can also be terrible at the same time. Um, I, yeah, for, in terms of finding support there, are, and again, different, we have to recognise when, in my work, some of the support services we recommend I'm, I don't personally like. Then, you know, some are better than others. Uh, they're like beyond blue and that kind of stuff. They're not always the best when it comes to helping um, different people from different communities. So it's, you know, I would say the internet in some cases, I would say relying on your friends and family and that kind of stuff, it's, it depends on what you're after to an extent. It's really, really hard to find support um, that can be effective for you and it's not always, generic services in my opinion aren't always the best. Yeah. They're not really good at dealing with specific um, experiences and particularly like the experiences I've had can't help you know, the big services are so generic, they're not always helpful. And I think we need to talk about that more too. Mm. Um, what about both of you? Yeah, look, I think online, you know, support groups on you mm. know, media platforms like so that are closed, mm. those groups yeah. can, can be useful and can be relatively safe spaces. But I would also, I guess, um, monitor how much I wanted to share on those closed groups as well. Yeah. I don't think you can replace one-to-one -one counselling and support. And I think mm. if there is an opportunity for that, having both, one that's available 24 hours, which is your online group, mm -hmm. one that you can actually have a physical appointment with, is good for your mental health and wellbeing as well. Yes. Yeah, and you have to be careful about the boundaries you have when yeah. hearing these stories coming in, yeah. Thank you, Melissa, for your advocacy, and I, I mm. see what you're doing, and it, we need more people doing the kind of work you're doing. Mm. Um, I'm sorry that it's sometimes hard and hard in the trans community and hard in feminism and mm. uh, imperfect. Uh, I will say that you found a really good room here. You know, the <laughs> fact that, like, this is a great space um, because of the people who make it so. And uh, I probably, I would say the Queen Victoria Women's Centre is so on it and the Feminist yeah. Writers Festival is so on it, they probably have already, right now, a bunch of links to potential places Sources. you can go. I hope not. If not, I know they'll do. They'll start typing. They will now. <laughs> um, I mean, I have, I I think, have a few. I think, yeah. you know, you can say it, they're imperfect and that is unfortunately true, but there are some resources and also, like, just the amazing people we're around right now. Like, yeah. that's the people I've met online, the people I've met in this room and rooms like it are the people that have helped me to get through and perhaps that might be the case for you as well. Mm. And also the different, yeah, face-to-face um, -face counselling is brilliant. Phone counselling is good. You can get counselling online if you're more comfortable in those mediums. So there are those different options available too. I know that um, some of my friends are less comfortable with face-to-face, -face, so they would prefer to have discussions yeah. online through a chat room. So there are those different options too. Yeah. Um, in regards to social media, um, I find myself censoring myself a lot. Yep. Um, just to avoid potential backlash. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you negotiate being an advocate and expressing your viewpoint with the possibility of trolling, the possibility of online violence and potential mm -hmm. real life violence um, and threats? Uh, how do you deal with that? How do you um, make those decisions? 
Everyone up here's who got that. You know. I think it. I mean, I mean, I think it can vary from person to person. In 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 a word, you can you can decide what battles you want to fight. You know, mm. not not everything is up there for for the taking. I, so pick your battles. Yeah. So pick your battles. Disable comments. Is a great one, um, mm. and often if you even, block. often if even if you're writing for an online journal, you can actually request them to not have mm. comments on that article as well. Mm. If that if that helps your mental health, which has helped mine, um, or just you know, choose what you put on your personal page, what you put on your public page. You know, you can make those little individual choices as well, because sadly we do live in a world where um, people come after your personhood, regardless of whether you're talking about a generic issue. They'll always make it personal. So I think it's, yeah, playing it smarter, being strategic about what you post, where you post it, um, and then yeah, and deciding in the first place if you really want to engage. I personally don't en engage in thread arguments at all. I never have. I don't have the time or the interest, actually. I'd rather You're sleep. not getting paid for it. I'd rather yeah. sleep, personally. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I think disabling comments has been really, really helpful. And blocking, the power of the block. I don't think we should underestimate that on Twitter and otherwise. So, yeah. yeah. And when I say, sorry, you're not getting paid for it, it, it comes back for me to that because the hours that you sink into educating oh, yeah. someone online, yeah. particularly when they don't want to be educated, they're not there to learn something different, they're there to fight. How much time do you sink into that versus doing worthwhile things? And that's yeah. me with my feminist manager's hat on. So the work I do when I look after other women, I, a lot of the time, look after their social media profiles for them. I'll do it for free for friends of mine or members of my community to the Slut Walk Melbourne page. We don't have the time for this. We'd rather be out there doing actual work. So we will, you know, use that block button, ban people from the page, you know, whatever else it involves to actually get our work done because they're hurdles in that situation. And so we have to create safe spaces. Yeah. What about you, Tara? Um, yeah, I, well, I, yeah, I produced this documentary last year on cyber hate mm. because this um, has become such a central and relevant topic, particularly, well, for people in all kinds of advocacy, human mm -hmm. rights advocacy um, across all different areas, but feminists also getting it in particularly mm -hmm. sexualized ways. Um, you know, the rape threat, the rape death threat being, uh, you know, mm -hmm. so common now that mm -hmm. it's, it's just like, uh, it's just the go-to for someone. Um, I want to say someone. They are someone. They are Tara. They're someone, even though they're doing this stuff. They seem like they're not mm. even real people sometimes. Um, so I would say that you just have to keep um, seeing how you're doing and asking, why am I doing this? I've, I've got a great, um, I've got a great little thing on my desktop. It's just a saying, and it's, I'm paraphrasing here, but it's something like, I don't have to accept the invitation to every fight or some, something along those lines. Mm. And I sometimes just remind myself when I see someone write something very, very inflammatory or horrible, mm. I kind of go, what, if anything, will I do with that? Maybe nothing. Mm. Maybe I just like, no, nah, you're, really, okay. you're really trying hard, but not today. Not today, but Satan. Some not exactly. Today. <laughs> not today, Satan. But, um, but other times, I think, yeah, look, for me, actually, I do want to respond. And I have a right to do that. And um, a lot of the narrative around when that came out, like it was a year or so ago, uh, and it changes, the narrative always changes, but it's often very victim blamey. And what was happening at that time was kind of like, you know, if you respond or retweet ab abuse, you're just as bad as the abuser and kind of like that you'd done something mm -hmm. wrong and asked to be abused. That, that idea hasn't quite gone away, but it was a very big focus at the time mm -hmm. and now it's shifted to other things. And part of the point of the documentary was just to show like it doesn't, if someone wants to abuse you, they will keep finding They'll find ways. a way. Mm -hmm. yeah. It doesn't, it's not your fault. You haven't done something wrong. You haven't articulated yourself badly. You haven't been at fault. You haven't broken any laws by existing mm. and speaking. Mm. Someone has chosen to abuse you, and sometimes in a criminal, you know, legally criminal yes. way. And just to keep the focus on the perpetrator mm -hmm. and say, you know. So I think that you have to just keep managing, like, is this okay for me right now? I don't have to. You know, when, mm. when you're baited or uh, threatened, you have some options and take those options. And sometimes it's just mute. Sometimes it's going to be report. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's going to be report to police. Yes, yep. um, to be clear. And, and you have the illegal. right to do that. Mm -hmm. You have the right to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I'm just going to 
shoot back something cheeky. But if I do that, <laughs> it'll be for me. It won't mm -hmm. be because they're demanding something and I believe that their demand is, uh, is valid. It'll be like, no, I feel like saying something to this. I like, and this is following in the grand footsteps of Karen Pickering, my mm. favourite response to those is the James Van Der Beek crying face. <laughs> so, <laughs> Karen and I both have it saved on our desktops yeah. and we both just pop it up there when we come to trolling complaints it's, and then block them. Yeah, yeah. and that, they get kind of probably they quite get very mad annoyed. actually about yeah. that. Right. It's great, you know, like, so I think you need to... You need to do what you need to do for mm. you, but being silenced is just not okay. So yep. find a way, and maybe it's online and maybe it isn't. And mm. I've seen certainly a lot of shift with yeah. feminists who were previously online uh, or previously say columnists, mm. and yeah. then the amount of death and rape threats they got was just enough to yeah. make them go, I'm gonna keep being active in my community and I'm gonna do it mm. different ways. And that's really valid and, too. Just yeah. find what you have to do for you and be flexible. Mm. And also, just a final note, rely on, um, if you can, and if, you ha if it's available to you, rely on your community, your friends, yes. get help in that regard. So if you have public pages, get help in monitor moderating the comments or whatever yeah. else. People can be there and it's helped if you're a step back from it and ha can have someone deleting those comments or helping mm -hmm. sort of uh, let things through or let other things be blocked. Take a step back if it gets too big for you. And get I do love the mute button. Oh yeah. Pretty great because like you just they don't know you've blocked them. you're not seeing what they're saying anymore but you just know they keep shouting at clouds and you're <laughs> you're just like yep I know it's one of those really super abusive people and that's fine they can just keep shouting at clouds <laughs> and stay busy and I'll keep doing my work and mm -hmm. um, so yeah there's different ways to approach it yep. but and there are resources out there that talk about this as yep. well mm. feminists are good at writing that stuff up yeah, yeah. <laughs> we are almost out of time I'm gonna take a quick question um, and then at, at the end of the, the responses, I'm just going to ask everyone to please stay in your seats so that we can get our speakers out the door first. <laughs> um, and they will go downstairs. Um, there are uh, readings is there with a the bookshop and there'll be some signing time. And just a reminder that we do then need to whisk Tara uh, to a taxi into Sorry. the airport so she doesn't miss her flight. <laughs> um, and, um, and so... I'm not going to come back, so I just want to say thank you all for coming today and thank you again to our venue mm -hmm. partner, uh, the Queen Victoria Women's Centre. So last question and then um, we'll move through our process. Yeah. Hi. Um, like everyone else, I just asked for a little bit of advice. Like, literally while you were talking, my friend was messaging me because um, we are curators and we went to a talk recently with some artists and... One of them has been mes one of them has been messaging her constantly. One of the artists. Yeah, through um, Instagram. At first, she thought he was just trying to get her to do a show, but then it was more. And one of the things she puts on, she does pole dancing as an exercise, and she mm -hmm. when she's really proud of a move, she'll put it on Instagram. And so this man has been making comments about her body mm -hmm. um, and saying how strong she is and stuff like that. And she keeps um, telling him that he's making her uncomfortable, but he keeps messaging her. Mm. And um, this is not the only time this type of thing's happened to her in particular, but I also have another friend who has been victim of other kind of mm. sexual harassment, and it doesn't happen to me, but it's happening to the people around me, and they always ask me for advice. And, I mean, what do you do? Like, I mean, specifically the person who's messaging me right now, but in the other one as well, I mean, what... What do you do? There's some good technical things I would recommend. Mm. Um, just, again, it's always a choice of how you want to handle it. And mm. This doesn't make the abuse go away, but it can help. Uh, so in terms of the technical stuff, I'd say switch off your notifications. For mm. example, I don't need my phone to go ping. Someone's tweeted you with, oh my God. You know, yeah. I don't actually need to see that or have it like the abuse arrive in my back pocket when I'm not prepared. Um, and so different sites should have various ways to turn off like messages that are private from people. The ones that are public are not, you're not able to uh, avoid. So it doesn't make that go away. But there's something about the intimacy of private messages that are very abusive or pornographic, which can be uh, really a big problem. Um, I also have a recommendation that um, if possible, you try to use the public online spaces when you're in a public space. And um, this is just a thing I practice personally and some other people find helpful. It's not for everyone, but I wouldn't, for example, check my Twitter or Facebook in the bath or yep. in like my bed, where it's like a 
personal, intimate space and I might not be you know, dressed. It's when I'm ready for the day and I'm here, I'm like, okay, I'm ready to go out into the world and it's virtually going out to the world, but it's still going out to the world and I'm going to get what the world has for me, which is sometimes going to be really violent and sometimes going to be really amazing. Um, but I find creating that psychological buffer is really good. So that's, it unfortunately doesn't make abusive things go away and it's never okay and it shouldn't be up to you to manage it. But those are some of the things that I've personally found help me to cope. And I think that's unfortunate. What we sometimes need to do is kind of think of like, how am I going to survive this? Because things continue to be massively imperfect in this respect. And don't be afraid to report and block yeah. and mute. Mm. Like, yeah, block. I would have said just you can block on Instagram, so mm. I, I would definitely block it. Keep mm -hmm. a screenshot or two just for archival purposes, just in case. Yes. Um, and if it has, you know, bordered to the point of being threatening, definitely report it. Yeah. And you and you have evidence as well, so you can you can do that. Mm. I mean, this is just a side note, but um, yesterday, you know, my mother again, she was telling me how when she gets people knocking at the door selling stuff in the evening and she gets it at the wrong time. She has a really in interesting way of dealing with them. She tells them, why are you coming here? It's my meal time. I don't come to your house. And mm. then she actually says, stay there while I get my camera. I'm going to take a photo of you and send it to the police. <laughs> <laughs> that would be really effective. I love it. I love it. And they literally run off. Oh, no. uh. <laughs> she just told beautiful. me that last night. I was like, where did she get that from? So, um, <laughs> So, I mean, you can always respond yeah. with, I'm, I'm actually sending these messages to, to the police, FYI. Yeah. Just see if it continues. Mm. Yep. Yeah, actually, keep, yeah. keeping evidence is important. I mm. have a rather unfortunate folder on my computer yeah. filled yeah. with garbage yeah. and vile, horrible... Non-constructive feedback. Yeah, it's the swamp. <laughs> I call it yeah. the swamp, yeah. and I stick the stuff in the swamp. And then mm. if someone keeps popping up, especially if, like, I've already blocked them, but they pop up elsewhere and I go, hmm, that sounds like the same guy. Um, I'll, I'll actually, you know, maybe that will be a, when I will need that evidence to present a mm. full case to uh, whether it's the police or just that platform or whatever. So I hate doing that, though. I hate even having it in my life, mm. like preserving it in some way. But, um, but I'll do that in, um, in cases where it seems appropriate. And unfortunately, we have to always just make these choices. Am I going to spend the time doing all the blocking? Because that in itself, like I could spend a couple of hours every Monday, sometimes I do, mm. just like blocking the threatening stuff and reporting the illegal stuff. Mm. Like that can be two hours. Like no one's no one's paying. No one's paying me. It's not my job. Why is that the theme for today? No my my novel is no closer to being finished, but yeah. um, I have reported stuff, and then I have mm. to deal with, you know, whatever Twitter or whatever platform getting back to me and saying oh, it doesn't breach our community standards. I'm like. Really? Okay, let's talk about this right now. Yeah, because, well, what are your communities? You know, I, yeah, so <laughs> it takes time, but, you know, you just have to decide whether you want to take that time, and, and there are lots of great ways to handle things. You just have to find out what's right for you, I think. Um, not, not to be rude, but fuck that guy. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> what the hell? Like, it's, I mean, I know I have these conversations all the time. It is 2018. Where has he been yeah. for the last, you know, yeah. decade or so? Yeah. yeah. What does he think is going to happen out of this kind of stuff? It doesn't sound like she's blocked him yet, but yeah, forgot. And also, it's, you can, whatever path you want to go down, you can just block and delete and get rid of him and screen cap it. You can first of all just say, this is making me really uncomfortable. This is not, you know, these comments aren't appropriate. And then, like, you don't need to engage in a dialogue. If you want to, fine, you can then block and delete him, call him out on his behaviour, whatever she's most comfortable with, because he's the one doing this yeah. to her. It's his fault. So she can respond in, you know, basically yes. whatever way she wants. And if that's, you know, engage in a dialogue, if that's just block him, whatever she wants. But, uh, yeah, whatever she is most comfortable with. But that behaviour isn't okay. And she can remove herself from it, you know, in whatever way she wants. And hopefully won't have any fallout as a result. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask everyone to please join me in thanking us for this question? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I also just want to give a huge shout out to our volunteers who mm. have been so amazing in the lead up Woo. and on the day today. Uh, our next session today is actually sold out, but there are still some tickets available at the door tomorrow if you don't yet have a ticket and would like to come along. 
Um, Conscious Closet, who are located downstairs, have offered attendees a discount of 25% uh, on their op shop downstairs today. Um, they're open till five, and your code word is Everyday Rebellion. Um, <laughs> So now we're going to move into the book signing. So as I mentioned earlier, if you could just remain seated for a moment, our speakers mm. will make their way downstairs and we'll have a brief time with Tara and a little bit more of an extended time uh, with the other two. And, and thank you so much for coming today. Mm. Let's go.